Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to talk to the House about my long-term vision for agricultural support in Northern Ireland. I also intend to announce a number of simplifications and improvements that I am making to the rules governing the direct payment scheme for the 2021 scheme year. Pillar 1 of the Common Agricultural Policy provided £293 million of direct support to Northern Ireland uh, farmers per annum. CAP payments have have been of major importance in sustaining the industry in Northern Ireland and underpinning its competitive trading position, and accounted for 79% billion of the cumulative total income of the Northern Ireland industry over the past seven years, 2013 to 2019. In 2018, my department undertook an engagement exercise on potential future agricultural policy framework for Northern Ireland in this proposed framework of officials in conjunction with key food, farming and environmental stakeholder identified four desired outcomes and long-term vision for Northern Ireland agri-food industry. These are an industry that pursues increased productivity in international terms, closing the productivity gap which has been opened up with our major suppliers, an industry that is environmentally sustainable in terms of its impact on and guardianship of air, water quality, soil health, carbon footprint and biodiversity, an industry that displays improved resilience to external shocks such as market volatility, extreme weather events which are ever more frequent and to which industry has become very exposed, an industry which operates within an integrated, efficient, sustainable, competitive and responsive supply chain with clear market signals and an overriding focus on high quality food and the end consumer. A number of projects have now been established within the Department <coughs> to collate evidence, identify gaps and develop policies that will help deliver these outcomes. So in June 2020, I announced my intention to bring forward a co-designed environmental strategy on behalf of the Executive entitled the Green Growth Strategy. It will align economic growth and development with the protection and enhancement of natural assets. The Northern Ireland Future Agricultural Policy Framework has been developed in line with the Green Growth Principles and will help to deliver its objectives. I anticipate launching this new future agricultural policy framework in early 2021, and I will update the House further at that time. Today, however, I want to broadly outline my vision for future for support payments. Leaving the EU provides for an unprecedented level of regional discretion and flexibility with regard to future agriculture support in Northern Ireland. This is the most significant change in policy affecting the agriculture sector in over 40 years, and it means that our policies do not have to be constrained by the EU cap Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 construct. We need to move to something new, which better addresses the needs of Northern Ireland agriculture. And this represents a unique opportunity to develop a new dynamic for key stakeholders across the food, agriculture and environmental spectrum, to work with Northern Ireland Government to chart a new way forward with common purpose. And for this to be successful, it is vital that the long-term outcomes of productivity, resilience, environmental sustainability and supply chain functionality are kept to the fore, which will demand difficult choices, compromises, as well as strong leadership at all levels. These four outcomes complement and reinforce each other, and they are broadly supported by stakeholders. A healthy and sustainable environment secures long-term agricultural productive capacity and underpins resilience. Productive agriculture minimises waste and maximises resource efficiency, which underpins environmental performance and reduces exposure to market risk. And an integrated and efficient supply chain ensures that agricultural activity is properly focused on delivering market demands, thereby minimising wasted effort, wasted resource and inefficient supply chains and reflecting broader societal demands for sustainable production methods. The primary tools available to us – science, education, incentivisation and regulation – are applicable to helping deliver all of these outcomes, and my focus is now on how we can best deliver these outcomes with the tools and resources that I have at my disposal. Today also allows me to once again put on record that, going forward, I want to devise support schemes that provide opportunities for all our farmers. No farmers should be left behind. Schemes and support are needed to help farmers develop their business, no matter where they farm, to become more efficient and to maximise the sustainable returns they can achieve from assets at their disposal. These assets include the environmental assets on their farm. I believe that farms, especially those in hills and other disadvantaged areas, are well placed to play a major role 
in delivering more of the environmental outcomes the people who live here want and that we owe to our future generations. And I believe that farmers should be properly rewarded for delivering these environmental outcomes and achieve a return on their environmental assets present on their farms. This offers a way forward where better economic performance and better environmental performance are the inseparable twin goals of any sustainable farm business. The House will be aware that the UK Agricultural Act gained royal assent on the 11th of November. I very much welcome this Act. It provides a platform on which we can start to move forward. Ideally, I would have liked to have had a locally developed Agricultural Act taken through this House. However, that was not possible in the time available to us. But the Agricultural Act that we do have provides us with sufficient scope to introduce the changes that will set us on a new pathway. The current working assumption is that the budget for the future agricultural support payments for the remainder of the Parliament will be similar to the current direct agricultural support budget of £293 million per annum, plus a proportion of the Pillar 2 budget. This ring-fenced funding will need to cover all the support measures we wish to introduce. Current direct agricultural support is distributed by a decoupled area-based payment. I do not believe that this mechanism as it stands will deliver the outcomes and the agricultural industry that we wish to see. Nevertheless, I want to explore the rule for a basic area-based resilience payment that provides a safety net, but will not blunt the incentive to become more productive and to deliver better environmental outcomes. Careful analysis is necessary to identify an appropriate design of this mechanism that could reflect issues such as scale of operation, uh, that is, a cap on the maximum payment and, indeed, a minimum lower threshold activity and so on, which was set in the context of a cross-compliance regime <coughs> that was designed specifically for Northern Ireland to help deliver policy outcomes. This will take time, but it is my intent to move as quickly as I can on this to provide the budget necessary to deliver new schemes and approaches. As part of a package, I would wish to use a proportion of the agricultural budget, budget to fund coupled payments, targeting, for example, suckler cow and breeding yield producers. It is important to stress that this would not be a return to the old couple payments of the past. We need to design in futures that will help achieve the goals of increased productivity and environmental sustainability. I have tasked my officials to complete a comprehensive review of the options for coupled support payments, and I had hoped to consult on this during uh, 2021. I want to say something on coupled support for protein crops. I intend to introduce a protein crop scheme for growing combinable beans, peas and sweet lupins for 2021. These crops will create a domestically produced source of protein for animal feed and provide agronomic benefits with arable rotations. I intend to introduce this for 2021 on a pilot basis and refine the approach for subsequent years to maximise the economic and environmental benefits. A major part of the new agricultural framework will, of course, be the Agri-Environment Programme. As I have already indicated, we need to create a regime that properly incentivizes and rewards the protection of existing and creation of new environmental assets. We will work with our farmers and land managers and environmental stakeholders to co-design a new approach to agri-environment measures that is focused on delivering outcomes and delivering a lasting legacy. We have the opportunity to create a new approach where management of the environment becomes a profit centre within the farm business rather than a cost centre. My officials are looking at a range of other issues that will contribute to a new agricultural policy agenda. These include the role of capital support, generational renewal, upskilling and professional development, opportunities to develop the horticulture sector and supply chain initiatives. And I hope to say more about this in the early part of next year. Whilst work is progressing to develop this long-term agricultural support strategy, I want to make some early changes to start to move us in the desired direction. Therefore, I have asked my department to review our approach on the current schemes and implement improvements and simplifications where possible that are in keeping with the longer-term direction of travel and what can be taken forward under the Agricultural Act. Therefore, with this in mind, on 1 January 2021, I have decided to implement the following changes. I have already announced that I will remove the greening requirements for the 2021 scheme year and incorporate the greening payment into basic payment scheme entitlement unit values. However, I will retain the ban on ploughing or conversion of environmentally sensitive permanent grassland under BPS rules. As currently designed, the objective of the greening requirements is to address a particular set of problems in cereal-producing regions 
where there is a predominance of very large fields that are devoid of landscape features and used for monocropping. The evidence is strong that greening requirements of crop diversification and environmental focus area retention have a very limited relevance to Northern Ireland. If anything, it seems to have been counterproductive by reducing the area of cropping and thus the diversity of land cover and habitat. My view is rather than persist with this failed initiative, it is much better to focus efforts and resources on developing a set of bespoke environmental measures that will ensure the delivery of environmental outcomes tailored for Northern Ireland which are adequately funded. Greening rules have added significant complications to the administration of the direct agriculture support uh, payments for both applicants and those administering the scheme. Removing greening will also greatly reduce the inspection requirement associated with the direct payment regime. Incorporating the greening payment into the overall BPS entitlement values will mean that farmers will see no difference in the funding they receive. Protection of environmentally sensitive permanent grassland will be enhanced by incorporating these rules into the basic payment schemes. So, whilst working on the development of bespoke environmental measures as uh, takes place, Northern Ireland's robust set of environmental laws will continue to provide protection against biodiversity laws. It is also important to remember that the landscape features, such as hedges and shucks, will continue to be protected under cross compliance. On capping of payments, given that the changes for 2021 uh, do not have a primary aim of altering the amount of funding farmers receive in 2021, it is my intention to make a technical adjustment to deliver a neutral solution on capping. However, this is for 2021 only, and I want to look at capping more closely as part of the longer-term approach to support and have asked officials to bring forward options for consideration. For 2021, I am limiting the number of entitlements that can be allocated or topped up from the regional reserve in respect of applications from young farmers and new entrants to 90 for each application. This brings the approach into line with the Young Farmers Payment. The aim is to prevent very large allocations from the reserve to individual farm businesses, which are difficult to justify, but what cannot at present be prevented. This change will also reduce the incentive to submit speculative claims or to exploit the reserve. I will also limit over-declaration to 100 per cent of the amount due based on the area determined. This will eliminate the need to apply offset penalties in subsequent years. At present, in some cases where an over-declaration is large, the over-declaration penalty exceeds the payment due prior to penalty. In such, case, in such cases, the payment is zero, and the outstanding part of the declaration penalty is offset against future payments made to businesses over the next three years. I believe the reduction of the payment to zero is an adequate deterrent against speculative claims involving the declaration of a large proportion of ineligible land. I have also asked my officials to review the approach to application of cross-compliance penalties as soon as possible. My aim is to ensure that penalties are proportionate and reflect the seriousness of the non-compliance identified. As I have used the primary powers within the UK Agricultural Act, secondary legislation to give legal effect to the 2021 scheme is currently being drafted, and I will bring this forward under the draft affirmative procedure in the future. I can assure the House that in developing the future agriculture framework and our approach to future agriculture support payments, I will consult with a full range of agriculture and environment stakeholders and keep you all updated. My ultimate aim is to ensure that we take full advantage of the opportunity to develop a sustainable agricultural industry in which farmers are supported on an equitable basis. This will be underpinned by a set of bespoke measures that will ensure the delivery of productive, environmental, sustainable, resilient and supply chain focused outcomes tailored for Northern Ireland. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I call Harry Harvey. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Minister, I welcome your statement today. At paragraph 19, and on the pilot scheme for protein crops, beans and sweet lupins, and of their benefits, how would you propose to encourage farmers to partake of this scheme, and has it been tried before? Thank you. It is uh, currently something which is available in um, the Republic of Ireland. Um, so, as I understand, it is close to €100 Euros, um, per acre of, of, of support. Um, uh, so, um, that, that, is, that is something which, which they have used. What I would say about protein crops is that there are two particular advantage, advantages to, to or actually three advantages to growing protein crops. What, one is that, that it increases the rotation that takes place. Um, the protein crops are, are, are good for soil in, in, in that they, they are 
they break it up quite well. Secondly, protein crops actually capture nitrogen from the, the air, so um, beans, for example, is a crop that, that will capture nitrogen. We have an issue with nitrogen deposition into uh, our, our, our peatlands, uh, so something which removes nitrogen from the atmosphere is something which is positive. Thirdly, uh, protein crops um, grown here will displace the requirement. Uh, you know, it will be a small displacement, I recognise this but it will displace some of the requirement um, for the importation of um, um, grains such as soya, which are largely grown in South America, and uh, an element of that uh, is grown uh, by removing rainforests. So, uh, on the environmental side of it, there are significant advantages um, to growing protein crops in Northern Ireland, and that's why I want to take that forward. I call Philip McGuigan. Graham Elgood, last can call you. Uh, uh, Minister, I thank you for the statement. It's uh, a lengthy statement and a lot of detail in it, but I'm, I look forward to uh, my role in the committee uh, going through it uh, and working with you to produce this. Uh, the, in total, CAP basic payment annually is $293 million and represents 79 per cent of the total income of our farmers, uh, and this is currently wholly funded by the EU. Uh, does the Minister agree that a level playing field on the island of Ireland uh, is critical to the smooth operation of our agri-food uh, economy and any future policy that diverges uh, away from CAP could cause disadvantage to our, our primary producers and rural communities here in the north? Well, uh, anything could happen. Uh, we also could be advantaged as a consequence of moving away from, from CAP. Um, I indicated um, that the removal of the greening requirements, um, which was uh, something which was much more applicable in, in large grain growing areas in France, and east of England, and so forth, um, but actually wasn't, wasn't being of benefit uh, in Northern Ireland. So moving away from CAP um, creates an obvious benefit um, in that respect without creating any environmental detriment. Um, so there will be areas that us moving away from CAP, which was a very broad-based uh, scheme for um, all of the European Union, uh, is something which we will be able to make bespoke to ourselves uh, in terms of how we support farming. And therefore, I believe that we can drive um, greater productivity and uh, better environmental outcomes at the same time and through developing our own bespoke uh, scheme. And I look forward to working with the committee in doing that. I call Patsy McLone. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his, his statement. Um, could I ask the Minister, just as we're, we're moving forward, basic payments are, of course, crucial to uh, underpinning farm life and providing sport income to farmers. Um, with Brexit looming, um, can the Minister give us any advice as to uh, what further assurances? have either been sought or received from the Westminster Government about additional and continuing support for farmers? Well, we continue to <coughs> raise these issues um, with the UK Government, along with other devolved administrations. Uh, so we take the opportunity at the interministerial group meetings um, to raise issues uh, of uh, continued support. Uh, we will continue to receive uh, reassurances on that front. Uh, but we will continue to, to keep pressing the case uh, for uh, agriculture and environment in Northern Ireland. Um, I should say that it probably was a much easier case to make pre-COVID um, in that uh, there was uh, a fair bit more money in, in the system. Uh, but if the UK government has to keep borrowing money at the current rate that it is, and I suspect that other European countries are in, 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 know that they're in the same position, um, it's going to put pressures on every other area, and you know that's something that we need to be alert to. Um, the current COVID crisis is creating an unsustainability in terms of, of, of public finances, and I trust that the vaccine will allow us to, to, to move on from this. But we're going to be left with debts, um, which are akin to, to debts that will be achieved um, by a war as a consequence of COVID. And ultimately, um, that could put pressures on public finances, um, and that could impact upon us. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank 
you. Minister, you refer to a major part of, your, of the new agricultural framework will, of course, be an agri-environment programme. Do you foresee in the future that NIEA and the Shared Environmental Services will work with the agricultural community in a more supportive role to enable modern progressive farming in parallel with the protection of the environmental assets? Well, I, I can't speak for Shared Environmental Services because they are paid for by councils um, and they're independent um, of ourselves. NIEA um, is uh, responsible to us. Um, although some members would prefer that we have an entirely independent environmental protection agency. And I would suggest that members who do look for an independent environmental protection agency to look at the rule of SES and then consider if that's what they really want. Uh, because I'd have to say, particularly in, in um, some of the more marginal areas um, where the land may not be as productive for the likes of um, big dairy farms and beef farms, uh, a lot of people have ensured that there has been renewal um, on those farms uh, through uh, the building chicken houses. So you go into many parts of County Tyrone, for example, um, there are um, quite a lot of chicken houses that, that, that have been built there. And those um, properties have, have ensured that people um, who have a skill, have an agricultural skill, have been able to stay on a farm which would not have been productive enough to keep them otherwise. And that's something sustainability is, is, is about a sustainable environment, it's about a sustainable economy, it's about sustainable food production. So in all of this, uh, in dealing with the problem, it is not through a blunt instrument of planning, it is actually tackling the issue of ammonia that needs to be addressed. And that's something that we as a department um, are working very hard to, to bring forward uh, proposals that will make a significant impact on reducing the ammonia emissions um, and consequently uh, negating uh, the damage that would be being done to the environment uh, by uh, further production. Uh, so we want to encourage further production, but we want to do it in a way which is sustainable. And I believe that as a department, that's what we're working towards, as opposed to just blindly saying, this is a problem, so we'll stop doing that uh, and that will uh, end the problem. We need to address uh, the issues that will resolve the problem, uh, but allow sustainable food production to continue. I call John Blair. Thank you. Can, can I thank the Minister for, for the detailed uh, statement, uh, in which point 13 seems to indicate a preference for a bespoke Northern Ireland Agriculture Act. Can I ask the Minister Deputy Speaker, um, given that statement is made there, and given the, the reality of importance um, of agriculture to our economy, the particular uh, quality of our farm product and the problem of rising ammonia levels. Could such uh, an act be developed to, to deal with these issues? Are there plans in place to do that? And if there aren't currently, could such plans be put in place in the future? Um, one of the problems that we have with this, the, the, this mandate runs out in 2022. Um, so for any legislation uh, to get through now, it's going to be uh, particularly challenging because you have your consultation process. You then have the work to do with OLC uh, in terms of developing the legislation um, and then the normal process of going through the assembly, which can take up to a year. Um, so whilst I would like to do a, an agricultural act, um, and that would be something which is desirable, um, I'm not sure that we will have given that, that or we will have the capacity to do it in the time frame. Um, particularly given that the UK has just passed an Agricultural Act, which, which is not perfect for us, uh, certainly gives us considerable cover. Um, so I do have uh, a number of pieces of legislation that I intend to bring forward, uh, but, but I don't think that I can achieve an Agricultural Act um, in the lifetime of uh, the current proposed lifetime of this Assembly. I call William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his statement and his vision for the future of agriculture. And it's clear that the Minister has a wide knowledge of grassroots agriculture as he makes a statement. In relation to uh, crossing and plan pa pa penalties, and he did say, you did say, I think, that you would look at that issue. Uh, there has been an issue in the past, and the Minister will be aware of this, I'm sure, 
whereby uh, penalties were applied to a former and he appealed to those, on those penalties and went to an independent panel. Independent panel in some situations adjudicated and supported the farmer, and the department refused uh, to agree to the independent panel's decision. What is the view of the minister on that issue? Um, I just used to find it incredibly frustrating when having uh, represented um, a constituent and won a case um, at an independent panel to receive a letter from an agricultural minister. Um, they were generally named, named Michelle, um, the agricultural ministers um, at the time, but um, to receive a letter from them indicating that they were overturning uh, the decision of the independent panel. I have made it clear to my officials that I won't be overturning decisions of independent panels. Why have an independent panel to look at these things, to give an assessment of how the department came to their point of view, of what the, the, the individual who made the claim had done, and arrive at a conclusion on the information presented to, to, to then just put a pen through it? It is entirely inappropriate. I won't be doing it. Um, and I've made that absolutely clear to officials that when the independent panel makes a decision, um, that is a final decision. I call Declan McAleer. I welcome the statement from the Minister today. Um, Minister, on um, paragraph 32, you made reference to a neutral solution on capping. Uh, so I would just like you to elaborate on, because I am aware during the last cap reform there was a, a cap put in the BPS. Cause the situation before that, there were farmers. Some farmers were getting the best part of a third of a million pound of single farm payment a year, nearly a thousand pound a day, and there was a cap then put in that there. Uh, so I'm just wondering, what specifically are you referring to? What's your ideas around this neutral solution on capping, which is on the uh, statement today? Um, for 2021, um, I don't intend to to, to change uh, the capping that's in place. Uh, but I would uh, make it clear that I do intend to change capping <coughs> going forward. Uh, so, uh, as we discuss uh, these issues, um, I, I don't believe that some of the, the payments are appropriate. Um, I know that some of the farms are large scale, uh, but I do believe that um, as we go forward, um, that. Uh, I would prefer to see the, the, the money spread. Um, more evenly. Um, I'd like to see uh, perhaps farmers who aren't just as large as scale receiving a greater proportion of it. Um, and I'd also like to, to deal with the issue of maybe some of the hobby farming that takes place, takes place where there is no real reliance on farming, uh, but people keep maybe um, a small acreage um, to engage in, in the hobby of farming. I, I'm wanting to support the people who are reliant on farming for a living. And if uh, someone is receiving um, large amounts of money into um, hundreds of thousands, uh, then they're somewhat less reliant than perhaps uh, people who are operating with uh, fifteen thousand pound of profit in a year. And uh, it's hard to feed your family uh, and keep a home uh, with that sort of profitability. I call Colin Gildenew. Gormy Agat, last can call you. Um, paragraph seven and eight. Minister referenced the European Union, and given that we are still within the EU reg regulatory zone and thankfully retain full access to the EU market, does the Minister appreciate the importance of continuing to align with EU policies in order not to disadvantage our local farmers with farmers in the south and in other parts of the EU? Well, on the regulatory aspect of it, yes, um, we will be aligning because that's uh, part of the, the protocol agreement. Um, that's uh, somewhat unfortunate because some of the, the cross-compliance things uh, do not uh, act in our benefit. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, that, that is where we are. Uh, in terms of moving forward, uh, I would remind members that whilst uh, the protocol uh, kept us in the single market, Oddly enough, the European Union don't want Northern Ireland to be participants in their free trade, trade agreements. So I would challenge the European Union on that. If they want to keep us in the single market, uh, why should it be second-class citizenship 
in that single market. And if we're producing uh, goods to exactly the same standards as the rest of the European Union, why then are we not entitled to be part of their free trade agreement? Now, we will be part of the UK's free trade agreements, uh, but why is the European Union not doing that? I understand that the reason that they're not doing that is because there's too much work involved. So I would uh, suggest that that should be reconsidered, uh, because if we're going to be part of the single market, um, as the EU desired, and as they negotiated um, with the UK Prime Minister, and as was decided by the Westminster Parliament, um, then we should get the advantages of it, not just the disadvantages. I call Justin McNulty. I thank the Minister for his statements. And thank you for educating me today, Minister. I thought shuck was an agricultural slang word, but now I know it's a real word, which is origins in, the lang in Irish, which my, some of my more learned Gaelic friends might give you more information on. In terms of, in terms of the basic payment scheme, uh, Minister, a typical farm in South Armagh, which is 80 acres, uh, 80 acres of land ownership, 40 acres taken, 100 head of cattle, uh, mixed um, beef, sucked or herd, what were the basic payments they were receiving and what will be the payments they will be receiving going forward as part of your proposals? Well, the poise word for shock, of course, is drain. Um, I thought it was more Ulster Scots than it was Irish, but perhaps uh, Patsy could educate us on that. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, it's, a, it's a good old word that's used in the country. And uh, people understand shock better than drain, so do they. And anyway, drains very often are, are enclosed and shocks are always open. So. Anyway, uh, in terms of, of, of farms in County Armagh, um, I, I, I know them very well. Um, I, I visit, visit, visit that area from time to time. I talk to farmers from County Armagh. And ultimately, uh, I, I know the land type uh, in that area, and it is you know, more suitable to, to, to suckler, particularly in the southern part of it, um, than it is to, to dairy. Uh, in the, more northern part of our maths is probably more dairy. Uh, but in terms of, of what, what we're looking at, it's how do we take away the, the, the broad instrument which just gives somebody a payment and, and doesn't reflect a lot on the work that they do? And how do we actually make that instrument um, encourage people to engage in, in keeping livestock, um, appropriately, appropriate numbers of livestock for their farm? Uh, and ensuring that they're supported to do that. Uh, so, supporting the suckler cow is, is something which, which is key. Um, LMC have put forward proposals along with uh, NIMEA and a number of other organisations uh, which looks at um, supporting suckler cows, which looks at supporting um, a bit of beef finishing and so forth. And I think it's important that uh, you know, we throw these things open to discussion. We set out an element of it. Um, that will that will go for for, for that type of support, uh, and that will be removed from the basic payment, and then shifted over into the, the, the other pillar, uh, which will allow us to then to encourage and, and particularly encourage younger people uh, to engage in farming. I know a lot of young people who would love to farm, but they haven't got the land. Um, maybe the, 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 there's land in the family. Um, but they, they just can't make enough money to, to get going at it. And I would love to encourage more young people to come into farming because it is a great uh, life. It is a great way of life uh, and it's a great career for people to have. But it needs to be a career where you know, young people can put bread on the, on the table and, and provide for their families if, if they go into it. I call Emma Sheeran. Minister, thank you for your statement. I noticed in paragraph 11, and you reiterated it there when you were um, making your verbal statement, that you want no farmer to be left behind. And it's an unfortunate reality, Minister, that many of the decisions that you've taken this year have left a lot of farmers feeling left behind, notably the decision to stop the transition towards a flat rate, which would have allowed farmers operating below the regional average uh, an expected pay increase of about 14%, as well as your uh, refusal to reinstate the ANC payment against the wishes of this House. Minister, what specific commitments can you make today to uh, assure farmers in less favoured and severely disadvantaged areas that they will no longer be left behind? Well, in terms of the scheme, um, if, if one looks at, at 
where the payment system was um, back five or six years ago and where it is now. Uh, you couldn't describe uh, those areas of, of being left behind vis-a-vis -vis others um, within agriculture. Uh, so actually quite a lot of the lowland farms are, are, are not particularly profitable and people need to recognise that. Uh, farming, farming in general is not that profitable and therefore encouraging farming um, and farm systems uh, which, where, where you can maximise the value for your product, um, where you can market your product in a way uh, which gains the highest uh, amount of income, where we can support farmers particularly um, on, on who, who can make real environmental benefits, um, where we can uh, provide them the support for doing that. And, you know, I'm open to ways and, and, and I'm happy to, to discuss this fully uh, with people in the uplands. Um, and they know better um, their land than, than anybody as to how to make it productive. But I am happy to engage uh, in qualitative discussions with uh, folks in the uplands uh, as to how best we can take things forward. Uh, but I do not believe that a flat rate system is something uh, which is to the benefit of agriculture. It is not to the benefit of a lot of the, the smaller farmers. Um, and it is a, a system which I do not think um, is the way forward. Uh, for the future of Northern Ireland. I call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement. In paragraph 31 of his statement, it says that Northern Ireland's robust set of environmental laws will continue to provide protection against biodiversity loss. Would the Minister not agree with me to strengthen those laws and ensure proper enforcement of those? Mm -hmm. We need an environment, independent environmental protection agency brought forward in legislation and enacted before the end of this assembly term? Well, I, I hear about independent environmental agencies and I hear about independence in general. And <coughs> then I hear people who say um, the courts haven't found that person enough. I hear that all the time in this chamber where people are challenging the courts about their finding system. The courts are an independent agency. I hear people discussing SES and the quality of their uh, planning advice, and uh, they are very critical of it in this chamber. They are an independent body. And I often ask a question, what are we elected to do? Because we are elected to be accountable to the people. So in terms of environmental regulation, what is wrong with having a system whereby there is accountability to this chamber in a way that an independent environment agency would not provide? I can come to this chamber and be held to account for the actions of NIEA, which does have a lot of autonomy in terms of what it does, uh, but I can be held accountable for its actions in a way that I couldn't be held accountable in this chamber for the actions of an independent independent environmental protection agency. And one of the things that um, I will be held accountable for is what I want to do in terms of uplands, because one of the areas of the loss of biodiversity has been decisions made in the past uh, to drain areas in the uplands. And that actually made farmland more productive in those areas. However, we now know that the most harmful thing in terms of carbon capture in our peatlands is uh, loss of water. And the reality is that we need to wet areas around those peatlands once again. And that's one of the things that we need to do in this um, new scheme, is to support those farmers. If we're going to wet land that they're not going to be able to, to, to you know, productively use, then we need to support them financially for the environmental benefit that will be created by wetting the peatlands once again. And that's an important piece of work to do. And I'm happy to be held accountable in these things, um, which I don't believe uh, would be the case were it an environmental agency, a lot and other lawyer. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it is an issue for this assembly ultimately to decide. I call Sean Lynch. At the last count, I want to thank the Minister for his statement. Paragraph 3 refers to an integrated and responsive supply chain as one of your desired outcomes for future policy, Minister. In the absence of an effective groceries code adjudicator, 
and no legislation guaranteed minimum farm gate prices. Can you seriously deliver this outcome? Well, I would agree with the member that the groceries adjudicator is not uh, particularly effective. Um, and I would say that there has been a, a noticeable uh, change uh, even uh, this year on the back of COVID, as there has been a, a switch maybe more to people buying their own produce uh, than, than uh, eating out. And it would demonstrate to me that perhaps um, the grocery chain is perhaps not the worst problem uh, that we have, albeit the big supermarkets have uh, massive buying powers. Uh, but the general public are quite discerning, and they do like food which is produced locally uh, when they're out shopping in the supermarkets. And you don't have the same opportunity to do that if you go out uh, to a restaurant or a cafe. And I think that there has been a tremendous movement towards buying local, um, you know, local butcher shops and vegetable sh shops and so forth, um, have been doing well um, throughout COVID because people have wanted that reassurance, and therefore want to build upon that, and, and build upon uh, the fact that, that people know that food grown in their own country is generally food which is grown to a high standard. You know, if I import chicken from some of the places in the world that, 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 that we are, are importing it from, I don't have the same assurances uh, that the standards are the same as they are here. So, you know, one of the reasons, and people talk about chlorinated chicken, uh, the problem isn't it was actually with the chlorination of the chicken. The problem is the fact that uh, there is considerable salmonella in the chicken that they need to chlorinate it in the first place. And the reason that there's considerable salmonella is that the stocking rates of the houses in those instances are far higher than they are here. As a consequence, they produce chicken cheaper because um, the stocking rates are higher, uh, but it's not of the same quality as, as it produced locally. And we need to be absolutely certain that the public know um, that what they're buying here um, is produced to the highest possible standards. And I want that to be in terms of the, the quality, the eating quality, uh, its provenance, its traceability, its, um, uh, 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 its food miles, its uh, uh, environmental impact. And I believe that in Northern Ireland, we can produce a product which ticks the A star list on every front um, if we can just uh, do a, 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 a few more measures and introduce a few more measures. We will be top rate for every aspect of our food production. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Minister, thank you very much um, for your comments so far. Um, as you know, I'm from the Arts Peninsula, and one of the areas that is extremely important to me, and in fact a number of your councillor colleagues, um, they work on the Arts Peninsula Coastal Erosion Group. And I was just wondering, under the climate change adaptation, where it talked about identifying and sharing information on best practice regarding community and private sector engagement in climate adaptation and governance models. Has there been any discussion on that coastal management? Um, we have a situation in the Arts Peninsula at St Anne's Point outside Grey Abbey where the reclaimed land has been breached. The sea has come in, or the loch has come in, and has, has basically poisoned. You can see trees are dead now. Um, so I was just wondering, is there anything on that modelling um, and on that governance? And for instance, has the Bateman principle been discussed at that being taken away and, and something you brought on board? Well, as coastal erosion isn't part of, part of this, um, it is a very important issue. And <coughs> County Down has a much um, softer landscape um, than County Antrim, which is um, considerable amounts of basalt and so forth, and, and always, uh, you know, remark at Port Stewart that those rocks that have withstood that battering you know, year after year after year. Um, County Down just isn't as, as, as sustainable a coastline uh, in that respect. So, coastal erosion is something that uh, we do take very seriously. One of the things that I am looking at doing is lighter mapping of all of Northern Ireland and that will involve our coastlines, and that will be a, a huge source of information. Um, I want to work with the Department of Finance on it, who have their own plan, um, but that will uh, give us a, a huge amount of information. I want to do that in conjunction with doing uh, or, or with, with uh, soil analysis, um, so soil testing every field in Northern Ireland. 
uh, which will lead us to a situation where we have a much greater understanding um, of the nutrient requirements um, that are required in Northern Ireland. Um, as we move forward on the environmental front, I want to see us doing uh, considerable work on slurry separation, uh, pelletisation of, of phosphates because we have too much phosphates, and instead of that going onto our land and ultimately into our waterways, um, it becomes a marketable product um, to other, other parts of the world uh, once we're phosphate deficient. Um, so these are all things that we need to be looking forward to, and we, we cannot stand still. We can't, can't do everything the same for decades and expect uh, the same results because the world is moving on, things are changing, uh, and ultimately there are things that we can do which will be considerably uh, beneficial for the environment, uh, but can also be uh, financially beneficial at the same time, and that's areas that we need to delve into and ensure that we can support uh, farms uh, and agricultural uh, producers as they uh, move to these schemes. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Minister. And just on the issue of you know, the quality of our local food, I think we should just be cognizant of um, the fact that people will buy the food that they can afford. And given the economic ramifications of the crisis that we're in at the minute, um, I think we need to be careful that the, the potential for um, cheaper imports to be within the budget of people here um, doesn't allow our good quality to be the major export for other markets. And I suppose that brings me into the question that, uh, you know, in your response to Mrs. Sheeran's, or Mrs. Sheeran's question earlier, I'm hoping that you can give us a wee bit more detail on the support schemes to provide opportunities for all farmers. Um, for example, is there specific measures that you're thinking to address fuel, um, farm poverty um, and the decline in farm gate prices? And I just ask that because one story from a farmer that I have who tells us that just two years ago he invested 500,000 um, in a, of a loan into a new hen laying unit. Um, and he the member has asked her question. Take 10 years to pay that back and take a 15,000 salary from himself. But a neighbour's son worked in a local factory and earned more. Order, for, order. For the Would the member come to a conclusion with her question? It's meant to be a short introduction and a question. So is there particular um, efforts being made to really get stuck into addressing the disparity in farm poverty? Yeah, and what, what the member raises in terms of the, the case that she's talking about, um, that is the sort of investments that's very often required uh, now to, to be sustainable in, in modern farming. Um, so you're looking at investments of hundreds of thousands of pounds. Uh, just to create something which is viable and, and produces a way forward. Um, profitability is, is the key thing, and how we support our agriculture in being profitable is much more important than support packages, uh, because that's, that's, that's how people want to, to make their living. Um, they don't want to be dependent on, on government handouts uh, where, where possible. They want to actually make the money themselves, and people are out there working extremely hard every day, deserve to have a good income on the basis of their hard work. Uh, what we want to do is to provide means of ensuring that agriculture remains sustainable. Having an envelope of close to £300 million is a huge asset to us, and how we spend that um, and how we utilise that is incredibly important to ensure that we get to that point where, where people are uh, productive in terms of bringing in their own finances. I call Jim Allister. Thank you. I, I generally welcome the Minister's statement. I'm sure it's a great disappointment to the many doomsayers, uh, some within this House and some outside, who told us that after Brexit there'd be no farming, there'd be no money, because the cash cow of the EU would be no more. What a lot of, not a nonsense that was. I welcome generally many of the things, particularly the end to greening, but I do notice the pledge that no farmer will be left behind. And I would ask the Minister, when it comes to the application of the environmental policies, can he ensure that that happens? For example, he has talked to this House about introducing an end, uh, a, a, a requirement for injection only surrey spreading. There are many small farmers who will never be able 
to afford the equipment in that regard. So in adjusting those policies, will he please bear in mind that no farmer should be left behind? No, and I accept what the member says, and that, whilst that is a, a course that we're moving to, um, and there is very clear environmental benefits from it, and there's also agricultural benefits in that there's greater utilisation of the nutrients that are actually applied to the land and, and less loss um, to the atmosphere as a consequence. I know that certainly on, on particularly steep land um, it can be more challenging um, and therefore uh, those are issues that, that we will need to address going forward. And many small farmers will of course use contractors and uh, whilst um, the contractors you know, have a, a significant charge per hour uh, for the utilisation of such equipment, uh, they do an awful lot of work in a very short space of time. Uh, so very often it, it pays better to bring in someone else uh, to do it uh, as opposed to have your own equipment. But nonetheless, the member raises a valid point in ensuring that uh, we do uh, create schemes and systems uh, which are not punitive uh, on, on people, uh, but actually uh, ensure that uh, we can assist uh, in what we do in terms of the environment um, at the same time as encouraging good farm practice, uh, which doesn't lead to, to a situation where it becomes unaffordable for people to engage in. I call Stuart Dixon. Uh, and thank you, Minister. I've been listening to the debate this morning, and I have some concerns and interest around the whole area about um, I, I, the future of agricultural policy, as you've described it in the paper, particularly around those areas of uh, resilience, increased productivity, environmental sustainability, uh, and improved resilience. How do you believe that that can be achieved uh, without the support of the European Union, without our ability to sell goods into the European uh, Union if that becomes a difficulty, if a Brexit deal cannot be done, and indeed without the support of the common agricultural policy? Well, the protocol obviously, um, whilst there are many disadvantages to it, um, there is one advantage that, that we do have access to the, 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 the single market. Um, so selling to the European Union going forward is not an issue, it's not a problem. And uh, Northern Ireland, of course, will have full access uh, to sell to the UK market, which is the strongest market um, for anywhere in Europe. It is the strongest market, for example, for beef, and pays the highest price for beef um, anywhere in the European Union. Uh, and therefore, access to that market, which takes over 50% of our product, the European Union around 25% of our product and the rest of the world um, the other 25%. Uh, so going forward, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that we will be able to utilise markets well uh, and to sell well into markets. I did make reference to the European Union free trade agreements and I thought it was somewhat incongruous that whilst they're keeping us in the single market and whilst then we have to apply um, all of the rules of the single market, uh, that they didn't seek to benefit us uh, with the free trade uh, uh, agreements that they are settling with other people. Um, so uh, the European Union uh, clearly wanted uh, to keep Northern Ireland locked in in, in many aspects, uh, but don't want to lock us in in terms of the advantageous aspects. And uh, that's something which I think they should reconsider. Um, and I know it involves work for them, uh, but nonetheless, uh, either they play uh, fair or they don't play at all. Called Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your statement today. Um, can you please outline how the environmental plans contained in your report integrate with payment plans and outline if any transition is required? And further to that, then, what um, conversations you have with the Department of fin Finance going forward? Because obviously, there's a lot of learning in terms of trying to get the COVID payments out and the um, business support grants. So it's really just about payments. Thank you. Well, uh, two, two issues. Uh, on environment, th this is a formative um, speech today which, which wants to open up a debate uh, as to how best we can do things going forward and how we can better utilise um, this £300 million package um, to support production and to support the environment. Uh, and uh, so, some areas will be more, farmers will, be, will, will benefit more more greatly from the environmental 
aspects of, of, of things going forward than, than they will from the production end. And uh, I think for, for most of them, um, whilst it would prefer, prefer to, to be engaged in production, uh, for most of them the bottom line is, is what really matters. Um, so that, that, is, that is something which we will focus very heavily on in ensuring that we do get better environmental outcomes from the money that we invest um, in single farm payment. And that is the end of our period of questions to the Minister on his statement. The Business Committee has arranged to meet at 1pm today. I propose, therefore, by leave of the Assembly,